the right place uh, to begin uh, our part uh, of the discussion today is with the community, uh, which is, after all, where everything for us begins. Uh, and therefore, the right thing to begin with uh, is how we make uh, communities, a subject which seemed to be easy 10 years ago, comparatively speaking, and has become difficult. Uh, the person uh, to lead that conversation uh, is my law partner, uh, the legal director of SFLC, the volunteer executive director of SFLC.in, uh, an important organization uh, that you don't think about because we live over here. Uh, she is the single best informed and most capable FOSS lawyer in the place we call Asia, uh, where slightly more than half the human race resides. Uh, and uh, from my point of view, one of the great triumphs of community building within SFLC. Mishi Chaudhry came uh, to the United States to do an LLM at Columbia Law School, which she finished in 2009 on a fellowship from the Software Freedom Law Center. She founded uh, SFLC.in the minute she finished working at SFLC in her first post-LLM stint. Uh, she has operated uh, that organization back and forth across the world since its foundation and has uh, now taken the day job operating everything we do from a legal point of view. She is uh, the leading community builder, since I, of course, only go around raising money and destroying things, uh, and uh, the most important member uh, at the moment of our team, bar none. So uh, I urge you uh, to welcome her and uh, all our friends and comrades here, whom she will introduce. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. Um, we're not going to talk about changes in the tech industry, which haven't happened in 60 years, but IRS, which actually moves faster and change, changing its attitude. <laughs> FOSS projects organize themselves in a variety of ways. Some of them are incorporated and have tax exemptions of their own, and the others are either associated or member projects of some other umbrella organizations, which themselves might have a tax exemption status. In the past few months, we have all witnessed the attention which has been paid to the hostility of the Internal Revenue Services towards force organizations seeking tax exemption. Because SFLC does a lot of legal work, or more legal work on behalf of FOSS entities, including setting them up and seeking tax exemption, we had recognized the problem's existence long ago and had started to design solutions for it. Whatever may succeed and what may not, we will know, but we thought it was valuable to understand what options exist at present for the projects, which are the organizations who can help projects get administrative and financial assistance and offer a warm hug in, relation, in exchange of all the problems, tax-related, finance, registration, domain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also want to understand what is being done in order to remedy the IRS's intellectual misunderstanding of what free software is, how it is made, and what the entire activity is. We have a great panel with amazingly experienced lawyers burning midnight oil to find out what the Problem, solutions to the problems are presidents of organizations who've been in existence for a very long time, have a lot of projects underneath, and um, new organizations, old ones, and everyone who's there uh, to offer choices and options for the projects apart from themselves trying to incorporate and seeking a tax exemption status. Um, I'll start from here. Aaron Williamson, um, who's been in who's involved in this problem and uh, has been working on it for a very long time. He's now an attorney at Tor Eklund PC, where he counsels software companies, startups, and other technology-focused clients on business transactions, FOSS and other intellectual property issues, regulatory compliance, and related matters. 
Previously, he worked as an in-house counsel at IEEE and as a staff attorney at Software Freedom Law Center, where he advised community free and open source software projects. So Aaron knows it right from the very beginning to what is being happening right now. To Aaron's right, we have V. Dale, and there's so many things which have been said about him already, but I'm going to talk a little, uh, whatever the formal in info I have here. P. Del Garvey drives open source strategy and advocacy within the company as an HP fellow in the CTO's office. Most recently, he was HP's chief technologist for open source and Linux. He took early retirement in 2012 and served briefly as senior open source advisor to Samsung before returning to HP in 2014. He has been a Debian developer since the earliest days of the project serving as Debian project leader from 2002 to 2003. He currently serves as chairman of the Debian Technical Committee. He's also the president of Software in the Public Interest, the umbrella organization about which we would want him to talk in detail, which provides fiscal sponsorship uh, arrangements in the traditional sense and various other services to the associated projects. And he also is on the board of directors of the Linux Foundation and serves on the board of the Freedom Box Foundation. There is too much to say about all the panelists out here. Next to that is Karen M. Sendler. She is the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, the nonprofit home of dozens of free software projects. She was previously the executive director of GNOME Foundation. Karen co-organizes the award-winning outreach program for women administered by the GNOME Foundation. And prior to GNOME, Karen was general counsel of the Software Freedom Law Center. She continues to do pro bono legal work with the GNOME Foundation and questioncopyright.org. And before joining SFLC, she worked as an associate in the corporate departments of big law firms in New York and London. She received a law degree from here and where she was a James Kent Scholar and co-founder of the Columbia Science and Technology Law Review. She received her bachelor's degree in engineering from the Cooper Union, and she's also the recipient of an O'Reilly Open Source Award and co-host of the Free As It Freedom podcast. To Karen's right is Jonathan D. Bean. He is counsel at the Software Freedom Law Center. J.D. holds a, J JD, holds a JD from New York University of Law School of Law where he was the senior articles editor of the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty. He also has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the George Washington University, where he graduated magna cum laude. Prior to serving as counsel for Software Freedom Law Center, he spent the summer of 2011 as a legal intern at SFLC and joining the organization in 2012 as an attorney fellow. He's admitted to practice in the state of New York, and will be talking about another umbrella organization found by SFLC, Free Software Support Network, FSSN. Now, uh, let me start with Aaron. Aaron, you have been associated with this project for a very long time. You've advised people, uh, you advise lots of projects in your capacity now as a lawyer at Tor Erkland. What are the choices you think the projects have, and when should they actually be looking into and exploring other organizations such as SPI, SFC, or FSSN? Um, if there's, am I on? Is that better? Um, okay. There's no microphone, so I'll try and speak up even though I'm bad at it. Um, if there's one message that I could have everybody walk away from this panel with, it would be um, do not incorporate a new free and open source software nonprofit at least maybe at all but at least without speaking to um, maybe somebody on this panel first or a lawyer <laughs> I know it's very self-serving to say talk to a lawyer before doing a thing I'm I'm not a lawyer. you could talk you could talk to me though um, um, but uh, there's, there is trouble at the IRS, and there has been um, since about 2009, um, when the IRS started taking a closer look at um, nonprofits. Let's see if we can help you. Oh, I turned it on. Okay. It's a control room problem. No. Sorry. Um, where the IRS basically started rejecting um, applications 
for tax exempt status um, from free and open source software organizations. And um, that issue persists today, although um, we've learned a little bit more about their reasons for doing so. But um, to give a very short overview of the issue, um, the free and open source software community has um, in many ways become a victim of its own success uh, insofar as uh, it has successfully encouraged um, the adoption of free and open source software in industry. Um, the IRS has come to see uh, FOSS as um, essentially uh, something that is, that is funded and that works hand in hand with industry and, and as a consequence, not something deserving of tax exempt status, not a fundamentally charitable uh, activity, but rather um, essentially the same thing as commercial software development. And so um, that's not to say that um, 501c3 status uh, is not available at all for free and open source software related uh, entities. Um, it's still something that, that under the right circumstances, certain organizations may have available to them as an option. Uh, however, it's not a process that any project should now enter lightly um, because there are, there are serious barriers at the IRS um, to doing so and uh, you run the risk of, of losing a lot of steam. Um, to give you just one example um, uh, and, and to illustrate why this applies not only to community organizations, um, and sort of grassroots community organizations, but also those, uh, and maybe particularly those associated with um, with uh, the companies who are using and contributing to free and open source software, the um, the OpenStack. Am I am I is that the right one? The OpenStack Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the OpenStack Foundation um, is a. Uh, 501c6 organization, a trade association. Um, what's that? Like the Linux Foundation, um, organized initially by a collection of businesses who uh, who have an interest in promoting uh, the development of a of a cloud platform, a common cloud platform. Um, and uh, they were initially uh, they initially applied uh, for a 501c3 status and eventually converted their application to 501c6. Um, but they've been stymied at the IRS in the same way that community organizations who have applied for 501c3 status have. Um, basically, again, to, to um, way oversimplify because of the relationship between the businesses who, um, who are the initial members and, and the project. Um, and so, uh, you know, these, these sort of traditional structures that we've had for um, doing community work together um, are are becoming unavailable, um, and so um, the community is increasingly having to look to other other sort of corporate forms um, to the extent that that's um, what's needed, um, and other ways of working together besides uh, the sort of traditional nonprofit structures. Thanks, Aaron. Um, for those of you who are wondering, five hundred one C. 3C6, it's the section of the Internal Revenue Code which lets you seek tax exemption. B. Dale, um, why don't you introduce a little about software in the public interest, which is a very popular choice for many FOSS projects, and also talk about what are the services SPI provides, how can a, mem how can a project seek uh, membership in SPI, and then what is the relationship between the project and SPI's board or SPI as an organization? Sure. So those of you who were here for Martin's presentation this morning understand that I have a day job, again, at HP. But uh, for a very long time, part of what I don't do in my day job has been uh, to be involved with an organization called Software in the Public Interest. Uh, SPI was created in the late 90s um, uh, initially because of a need that the Debian distribution had uh, to have a legal existence in the United States and the ability to uh, hold assets and uh, to accept donations. Um, the <clears throat> uh, we were successful at that time in achieving 501c3 charitable organization status and the original charter for software in the public interest uh, was drafted by people who had an expansive view of what the future of free software could be. 
And so instead of setting this up just as a umbrella organization to serve the Debian project, it was set up instead to be a sort of generic umbrella organization for free software and potentially also uh, free and open hardware projects uh, to, to sort of share in um, the legal existence and, and financial processes that would eventually come to be put into place. Uh, today, there are 30-odd projects which are associated with software in the public interest. The process that we use is that projects that have reached the stage where they either uh, have accumulated assets that they would like to have uh, be held in something other than individual hands, uh, or which for one reason or another find themselves uh, de uh, desirous of being able to accept donations and hoping to be able to offer their donors uh, the potential tax benefits of donation to a charitable organization, will approach software in the public interest and request um, uh, that we consider inviting them to become an associated project. Uh, unlike some of the other fiscal sponsoring organizations, SPI takes a very light touch with its associated projects. We want to make sure that their um, aims and their activities are in alignment with uh, our charter and bylaws and so forth. Uh, in other words, that they are substantial and significant free software projects, that <coughs> um, they are, that their activities are in line with our charitable uh, basis and so forth. Um, but we don't, as a general rule, try to impose any particular structure on the way those projects uh, engage in their activities. Uh, we essentially provide them with legal existence, with uh, a place that um, can hold things like domain registrations, trademarks, and so forth, uh, and with financial transaction processing mechanisms through which they can accept donations and then disperse those funds uh, to engage in, you know, legally acceptable activities that make use of those donations. Um, and so as a consequence, <coughs> the kinds of projects that uh, SPI ends up associating with are generally projects which have achieved some degree of uh, sort of internal structure and operating form by themselves um, and which need relatively a relatively thin veneer uh, of these sorts of services and legal existence uh, support. Um, and, and that differentiates us from other organizations that I'm sure you'll hear about soon uh, that take a more active role. Um, the projects that are associated with SPI vary dramatically in both their sort of fields of uh, endeavor and uh, their scale. Um, there are multiple Linux distributions, the largest one being the Debian project. Uh, there are multiple database projects. There are the freedesktop.org. Um, and there are some projects you've probably never heard of before, um, but which one way or another have met our criteria and that we provide services to. Um, a lot of times uh, we <coughs> uh, find ourselves uh, being approached by uh, projects that are just getting started. And uh, it's caused me to spend a lot of time thinking about when the appropriate time is for a project to seek uh, the connection with some sort of a fiscal sponsoring organization. Uh, one of the key moments sort of in the life of a project is when there are enough participants that people start to worry about what happens if the founding members were to disappear or to no longer be interested in participating in the project. And the reason this matters is that's usually the threshold in time when the uh, legal attachment of assets like domain name registrations start to matter to a project. Um, we have, in fact, had some projects associate themselves with SPI when a, an individual or corporation they were associated with um, disappeared or changed its behavior in such a way that the project found itself needing to change the project's name to avoid trademark entanglements or needing to register a new set of domain names and realizing that they didn't ever want to have to go through that chaos again, so now is a good time to you know, go find a fiscal sponsor organization to associate with. Um, having said that, <coughs> um, you know, we, we, we do have a, a sort of a litmus test around substantial and significant and if you look at the set of associated projects, you'll understand that that's a reasonably fluid boundary. Um, but it is always the case that on a case-by-case -case basis, we look at the projects that are approaching us uh, for associated project status and consider them on their you know, unique and individual merits.
is, is there a cost to becoming a project or an associated project? There's no direct cost associated with becoming an associated project. The way we uh, obtain our operating funds is that we generally agree with each project that's going to associate that we'll take a small percentage of their incoming donation stream and use that to fund the activities of the organization. That number, I believe, by default these days is 5%. And as a consequence, <coughs> uh, SPI has never sought and has only once received uh, a significant directed donation to SPI itself. I have to thank the Google Open Source Program Office for spontaneously giving us a non-trivial donation a couple of years ago. Um, but other than that, um, there are people who make donations to SPI without specifying a particular project to earmark the funds for, and the consequence of that is that they go into our general reserves. Our general reserves so far have only ever been used uh, for paying for the operating expenses of the organization with one exception, and that is that because it was germane to our own uh, operating activities, uh, we chose to provide some sponsorship to the project that was hosted within the Conservancy to try and work on better financial management tools for organizations like us. And uh, that seemed like a completely appropriate place to put some of our general fund donation money. Um, a little weird, you know, <coughs> one charitable organization giving another charitable organization money, but this was a case where we had a common interest and a common need and uh, the opportunity to put some funds together to try and improve things for everybody. So uh, that's the only case so far where we've ever taken anything out of SPI's general funds and, and applied it to something other than simple operating expenses. We do not uh, solicit funds for and then distribute those to uh, our uh, associated projects in any sort of a non-directed way. Um, in other words, we don't go asking people to donate to SPI so that we can then apportion funds out to our projects. We instead invite our associated projects to request donation streams from people that are interested in their work, and when those uh, contributions arrive <coughs> in SPI's financial inboxes, they are appropriately tagged as to which project they are intended for, and those funds are held in trust for those associated projects. Thank you. Um, Karen, you've been associated with the Conservancy since it was found, first at SFLC, then as a pro bono counsel, now you're the executive director. So tell us the mar about the model followed by Conservancy. Do the projects have an independent legal existence once they're part of it? Do you provide legal advice? And what Bibi Dale described about associated projects, how are things similar, different, or how do they become part, uh, those details would be very valuable. Okay, but I'm going to have to hijack the microphone first and, uh, and uh, just say that this feels like a very momentous occasion to me. I was a student at Columbia Law School uh, long before the Software Freedom Law Center was, uh, was founded and envisioned by Eben. And I wanted to just uh, thank Eben because I, when he started SFLC, it was with the, um, with the goal of creating um, leaders in free and open source software and in the legal field. So raise your hand here if you have been an employee of SFLC or are an employee of SFLC. Raise your hand if you're a client or have been a client or a part of a client. So it's, it's a big portion of the room. The impact has been tremendous. And I know personally that I would not be here in this room as an expert on this panel or, or as a speaker in free and open source software without SFLC. So let's just give Evan and the SFLC a big round of applause. Thank you. And for me personally, at the Software Freedom Law Center, I was hired to, as a, as a, to learn about nonprofits law because I had been a corporate securities lawyer. And so uh, non, this, this topic is very, uh, very close to my heart because uh, it was the first thing that I started to learn about before I even knew too much about free and open source software and informing Conservancy um, and uh, a, a bunch of other organizations like, uh, well, like Protocol Freedom Information Foundation, which is now FSSN, and um, working with Evan to figure out solutions for free and open source software was just incredible. Okay, so now I'll answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so the Software Freedom Conservancy is in some ways on the other side of the spectrum from software in the public interest, and as Bedell said, we, uh, we sometimes work together, which is great. There's um, a lot of reasons to have a lot of organizations in the free and open source software world, and each of them fills a different niche. 
And uh, so conservancy is kind of uh, fiscal sponsorship plus, is how we've been described recently. Uh, we do pretty much everything that a free software project might need out of their foundation. Um, so we do a lot of work on trademarks and helping our projects defend them. Uh, we organize their conferences. Um, unlike what Bidel was saying about software in the public interest, we do um, fundraising directly for our projects and help them organize. We do um, community management. We help them. Um, we have projects that we have weekly meetings with who are trying to figure out ways to improve their community and expand it, connect with their user base. Um, we do asset stewardship. Um, we do. Um, all kinds of things, and you'd be surprised how varied those things are and how they come up from time to time. Uh, there's a slightly different legal model for conservancy, which Mishi was uh, hinting at, uh, than software in the public interest, whereby projects that join conservancy are a part of conservancy. And uh, we at SFLC architected it in that way, in part to maximize the potential for, um, for legal protections. Um, but uh, there are a lot of other advantages that come along with it, which means that we can dive in deep where our projects so desire, and we can also sort of stay a little bit more hands off where projects are maturing enough that they can, um, or or are in the certain you know in the stage where they they have fewer needs. So it works out quite well. Um, it does mean that we are doing a lot for our projects. So. Um, we wind up having to fundraise for general funds because uh, the amount of percentage that we take from our projects would not cover even a single person, and we have a staff of three and a quarter. <laughs> so, uh, so, did I answer? I got distracted with thinking SFLC, <laughs> so I, I can't remember if I've. No, I want you to talk about the model and explain it about whatever you were going in the same line, and also the question also was that were you providing legal advice, and you did cover about the. Uh, Oh, there are. There, we do have a general counsel on staff, and um, as, as you've guessed by now, I'm a lawyer, so I wind up uh, filling in um, as well. So legal advice is a big portion of what we do for our projects. And uh, what is the process of projects becoming a part of it? Aha. So we, <laughs> we have an application process. We have um, an, eval an evaluation committee, which uh, is, is made up of leaders in free and open source software who evaluate our projects um, that apply and determine if they're a good fit for conservancy. Um, usually we have uh, certain tests, like is the project mature enough? Um, you know, is it controlled by a single company or is it appropriate for a, a charitable nonprofit? Um, we basically do this with every, uh, with every application that comes in and uh, it's very helpful as uh, Bidel was talking about that time period where you determine whether or not a project should be affiliated with a foundation is fuzzy. When the best time is for a project to affiliate is it's tough. Um, and so we were finding that because we have sort of a heavy duty structure in place that our eval committee was sort of finding that some projects were not, um, were not ready to join a foundation in a full capacity or at least not one like conservancy. And then we were also seeing that a lot of projects were in the situation where they hadn't affiliated or thought about some of these issues early on and that there were problems down the road. So for example, with domain names or with trademarks, um, when a project is founded, everything seems rosy. And then down the road, sometimes you'll find that the person who happened to register their domain name starts up a consulting company with the, you know, with the same name as the project. And that was the person who registered the domain name or the trademark, and that's problematic. Now, an entity like Conservancy in the way it's been architected to date couldn't really address that. So we've, um, we're about to launch, so I'm pre-announcing, sorry everyone, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm not really, a, anyway, so we're, we're having this new program called Starter Kit, and the idea is for projects who are, are, bef are before that point can come to us and can register their domain name and their trademark and have other advantages for, you know, consulting on community building and things like that, the expertise that we've collected at, at Conservancy um, individually and together, and I'm really excited about that. It's very complex under trademark law, so we have uh, pro bono counsel, um, Pam Chestick, who is helping us with that, who's fantastic. Fantastic. And um, so we're hoping to do more along those lines in the future. So are you fiduciaries of the projects? I mean, so projects are analogous to divisions of a corporation um, for us, which I think is true for some of the, so, so part of the expertise I, I was able to develop with the, um, with the help and, um, and uh, in cooperation with SFLC was that I got to be legal counsel to almost all of the uh, fiscal sponsors in our field, which was so cool. Uh, and so uh, uh, most of them, I would say, are set up in that way, the, the heavy duty ones, um, so like Apache and, um, and Conservancy, and of course, suffering the public interest is a different model, so. The thin veneer. 
a thin veneer. <laughs> Thank you. Apache Foundation, um, nobody could make it because of other obligations, but that is another example of uh, an umbrella organization. Um, but it has an Apache way of doing things. Um, we, ne we never touched about the licensing of different projects, but projects who become a part of the Apache Foundation have that distinction. Uh, moving on to JD, JD Free Software Support Network. Uh, you heard talk about SPI and SFC. Um, what is special about FSSN and how does it work? Uh, so uh, FSSN, or the Free Software Support Network, is one of SFL SFLC's clients. Um, FSSN is, like the other organizations you've heard about, a tax-exempt charitable organization. And it exists to serve as a facilitator for charitable FOSS projects and to work in collaboration with them. Um, so projects that are interested in things like administrative or fiscal assistance, they can enter into collaboration relationships with S uh, FSSN. Those projects maintain their own communities, their own governance structures, they build their own software, and they are allowed to collaborate with other organizations. FSSN they, uh, functions in well, a variety of ways, but one thing they can do is manage unrestricted charitable donations and assets in consultation with those individual projects. And where appropriate, they can expend those funds to serve the charitable needs of, um, of the projects by paying third parties for services, goods, things like that. Um, projects that are interested in learning more should visit the website, which is freesoftwaresupport.org. And ultimately, if they're interested in becoming, um, in joining uh, FSSN as collaborators, they can contact uh, the organization through help at freesoftwaresupport.org. Um, ultimately, it's not designed to be a one-size-fits-all. So the path to membership ends up beginning as a conversation and expressing what the organization is looking for as far as needs. Um, and desires and seeing if those match up well with the model that FSSN uses or whether they'd be better served by one of the other organizations you've heard today or one that is not currently present. So uh, do the projects have to be a client of SFLC to be a part of FSSN? Certainly not, though some are and can be. Um, and at times also FSSN's relationship with SFLC can provide some of that um, legal know-how that is, is of value to a lot of projects. There's another plug. Consult a lawyer before you actually make a decision <laughs> or talk to one of these people or the other ex uh, existing organizations before you make a decision about incorporation or embarking on which used to be a shorter journey but now has become unpredictable and much longer at the IRS about tax exemption. We do have um, Andy Optigrove here who would uh, like to at least tell us and can help us understand a little more about Linux Foundation, and so is Karen Copenhaver here. Uh, Linux Foundation is organized differently, and it's a 501c6, which is the section about trade associations or chambers of commerce or business league, but that also could be, some projects might be a better, might find that to be a better home or a better fit. Andy, Karen, do you want to talk about it? <laughs> There's a lot of understandable angst about the current situation with the IRS, partially because the position the IRS is taking is very inconsistent with a lot of prior you know, decisions, practices, whatsoever. That said, I think it's really easy to get too concerned about tax exemption uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, if you think about why do you really want to get tax exempt, if you're really going to unpack it, uh, there's a number of reasons. One is individual contributions being tax exempt. Uh, most projects these days don't actually get a whole lot of money. It's more in kind, you know, you get in there in code rather than contributing money. So the idea of being able to deduct contributions for an individual isn't that big a deal generally. And whether it's tax exempt or not, the corporate sponsors can still deduct the money. So they don't really care. Uh, then there's governance. Well, you can form, in fact, all the ones that incorporate do form, the ones on the, on the stage, will be either a Delaware not-for-profit membership corporation or a California mutual benefit corporation, all of which provide that members don't own it, that they have a tax-exempt purpose or, or a non-proprietary you know, purpose, 
So the perceptions and the realities are the same within a uh, tax exempt or a non tax exempt. If you were to look at two, one that's exempt and one that isn't, they look exactly the same. The only difference is one of them has a piece of paper from the IRS. On the other hand, particularly now where the IRS is making things difficult and where some organizations are trying to maneuver their formation and their purpose and their operations into what they hope is something that the IRS will bless, now you risk subverting your purpose to a tax exemption. And when you think about it, the only thing we haven't talked about is paying taxes. Well, I think anyone on the stage can tell you that the operating profit in an individual year is not likely to be too much. And a lot of organizations have dealt with this in the past, like, uh, like standard <coughs> organizations, that if you're gonna have your sponsorship or your membership on a calendar year, it really isn't very difficult managing to a zero budget. So, you know, tax exemption is nice, but no one should think that the world will end if you don't have it. Uh, the last point on that, a 501c6 uh, exempt organization does not actually have to file with the IRS for an exemption. So you can form an organization today as a 501c6, and unless the IRS wants to come after you, no one can tell you you're not a 501c6 because the exemption application and approval is not required. So having said all that, I think that there's still lots of good reasons to go under an umbrella. And in the great majority of uh, situations, people can, should, and will go under an umbrella. But I think that the tax exemption should actually be the last thing you know, on the list. So let me talk just for a second about uh, the Linux Foundation. I also defer to Dale, who's been on the board probably since day one. Uh, the uh, Linux Foundation also hosts projects. Uh, you can be an unincorporated or an incorporated uh, project. You can pick, or in consultation with the Linux Foundation, because it's a two-sided equation, uh, about whether this seems like the right way to go, but it is a possibility to be incorporated under the Linux Foundation. Uh, as the name suggests, it is the Linux Foundation, although the uh, actual tax exemption is open source generally, but you know the foundation will have projects that it thinks are appropriate for it and projects that they won't think are appropriate to its mission, but coming up, you know, if you have something that's important to Linux, uh, then, you know, it should be on your list of, of possibilities. If you were to say why Linux Foundation as compared to another umbrella, probably because Linux can sort of offer management on steroids. So if you want to have trade shows and uh, a big budget and lots of employees and uh, uh, that sort of thing, uh, maybe not uniquely, but certainly it does have a lot of resources to really take a mission critical project and punch it through uh, into success you know, very quickly. Plus it also, well, obviously also has the cachet of uh, you know, the organization as well. Uh, and also speaking of law, has sort of a you know, world-class uh, 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 think tank uh, of uh, 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 people that you, you sort of get access. And on that, I should turn it over to Karen, who can say a little bit about the, you know, the, uh, the legal prowess in licensing and similar matters that uh, we, we think the foundation has uh, in its uh, corner, if you wish. Right. Uh, and most of the projects are, are, are have specific sponsors from corporations and are worked on by many of the employees in those corporations. And there's a, an enormous amount of coordination among the um, the it, sort of the press relations people in those corporations. And I, I would say, based on some recent conversations, one of the things that the Linux Foundation does for these projects that might be the most important thing we do for the projects is that you have a lot of people inside the corporations who really don't understand open source at all, and the messaging and the, you know, the motivations can get very garbled across those staffs. You have people inside the corporations who understand it very well, 
but then across the corporation with these staffs, they don't necessarily understand it. And there, it's often the most important thing that we do is to push back on the corporations to remind them that this is an open source and collaborative project and their, you know, their own approach to it in terms of their own self-interest needs to be uh, heavily modulated <laughs> in, order to, um, in order for everybody to be successful in the project. So we do have a lot of, of resources and, um, uh, that are very helpful to the corporations. Um, I think that's juxtaposed to the uh, free software uh, projects that don't enjoy the benefit of the corporations that have de been dedicated to their individual success. Uh, there is a sort of an intersection now, though, among, um, we, we have at the Linux Foundation this core infrastructure initiative and, and Bedell might be the best person to talk about that, but I think that, I think that is probably the, the point of contact that's most interesting right now, if you want to talk about that. Yes, let me see. I think there's sort of three classes of projects that end up somehow being involved with the Linux Foundation. The first category of project is, the, is a class of project where one or more of the Linux Foundation's member organizations have chosen to work on a particular piece of software, want it to be an open source project and have it managed well and be perceived to not be controlled by a single or small set of corporations and they will come to the Linux Foundation with a project that's already you know, in some state of progress and say we would like this to be hosted at Linux Foundation Labs as a labs project. Um, and you know there are, there are a number of examples of that. Uh, Yocto is probably a good example of that class of project where um, there were a set of developers, largely at Intel, many other uh, foundation members were interested in this and it was a good project to be hosted there. The second large category um, are places where a number of Linux Foundation member companies recognize a common industry need and want to go tackle that industry need with an open source implementation. Uh, Open Daylight is probably one of the recent excellent examples of this. A uh, substantial number of companies agreeing to get together to develop protocols and an open source software implementation of those protocols uh, to tackle, you know, a major new area of uh, software technology. And then um, the third category are things like the uh, our core infrastructure initiative where the companies recognize that there's a need um, and they are willing to jointly put financial resources in place to attack that need and they're not really sure what to do about it. In the case of CII, uh, this was sort of in response to things like the Heartbleed attack and, and, and so forth where it was recognized that um, we have a situation where a number of uh, community initiated free software projects that have become absolutely essential to the fundamental operation of the internet, not just you know, the business transactions but sort of everything on the internet uh, were being underserved from a technical standpoint. They just weren't getting the attention that they needed. And uh, a number of companies, 20-ish, I think, have agreed to each put a substantial amount of money on the table each year to ensure that there's a pool of financial resources available uh, to put appropriate engineering and auditing and related activities in place around some of those projects. The initial list includes things like OpenSSL, OpenSSH, NTP, and I, oh, the other one's the auditing project, right? Uh, the crypto auditing project. So these are places where these companies have agreed that having a structure in something like the Linux Foundation that can aggregate resources from a number of member corporations and put a governance process in place to decide how those resources are going to be distributed and which projects can make best use of them are good examples. So to me, <coughs> it really is all about either uh, lots of corporate uh, financial resources uh, being intended to be put forward uh, and or a desire to have sort of, you know, first tier pro level marketing associated with a project that really have driven things in the Linux Foundation's direction.
Uh, and Karen mentioned this earlier. I mean, when projects are out there shopping for you know, a fiscal sponsoring organization, we often talk to each other back channel. I did the same thing with Bradley when he was uh, running that organization prior to Karen. And uh, we often make sure that you know, organizations that approach us understand that they have alternatives and that they should go shop around and talk to each of us and understand what the pros and cons are. And we do all end up collaborating to try and help make sure that the right resources go to the right places and that trust is preserved in a lot of places. And uh, you know, I didn't mention it earlier, but Software in the Public Interest does not have uh, full-time counsel, and we are really quite dependent on SFLC to provide legal guidance and assistance to our associated projects when they need that help. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for telling us also about the Linux Foundation. Um, now, the organizations and structures that we have heard about, these are the options available. And as Aaron said, after talking to him, definitely talk to all of these structures and the people who run these organizations. But these were devised and made when the attitude of internal revenue services was either neutral or positive towards the organizations which were working for facilitation and production of free software. Um, IRS applied the same rules, which were largely predictable, and we were able to create a lot of nonprofit tax exempt organizations. Uh, and Karen did a lot of that work. Uh, but it seems that obviously that there is some change in the attitude, and there is um, there are efforts which are being now uh, made in order to address that problem. Adam, do you want to talk a little about the task force, which is now trying to address? the problem of what's going on are at the IRS? Are we on the be on the lookout list? Are <laughs> we on the keyword list? Um, free software was actually on the be on the lookout list, the same list that the IRS used to determine whether uh, they should give extra scrutiny to Tea Party related. Actually, it's open source, right? It was open, <laughs> yes, it was open source. Um, and there is a, there's a nasty little note on the list. You can find documents that were obtained with a FOIA request um, that show open source and, and the IRS's rather skewed opinion of, of what uh, free and open source software looks like. Um, but uh, yeah, as Mishy mentioned, um, there's a working group um, that was formed by the Software Freedom Conservancy and the Open Source Initiative um, that I'm uh, serving as chair of. Um, that's taking a look at um, what's happening at the IRS, uh, what uh, uh, alternatives are available to new projects that are looking for some sort of structure um, for their uh, for their operations, um, and um, how we can sort of as a community move forward and provide the right guidance to projects who are uh, who are looking for some kind of structure or uh, tax exemption for their project. Um, and so if you're interested in joining that working group, there's a, there's a mailing list um, run uh, out of the Open Source Initiative, and I encourage you to, to join us in that effort. Um, but I, I agree with Andy that, um, that you know, we shouldn't be too frightened of this as a community. I think that he's right that we've relied uh, over much on tax exemption as a sort of signal of right-minded community behavior in the free and open source software community. I think a lot of projects, when they became sort of sufficiently um, mature, decided that for whatever reason, the next step was to incorporate and seek tax exemption um, because that seemed like the right thing to do even though there wasn't necessarily any benefit down the pike in terms of um, you know additional funds available because they had tax exempt status or whatever it was mostly serving as a signaling function to say we're the type of organization that you should give contributions to. And it's not like um, no C threes are being granted now. There are mm -hmm. C there was a, a period of delay and there are some C threes that are going through and mm -hmm. I think the OpenStack C six refusal is uh, was very particular as well uh, in terms of reading board minutes and the promotion of a product. So I think that the legal analysis might look a little bit bleaker than it is as well. But of course, it, it varies uh, very much depending on, on the project. But we're lucky to have these fiscal sponsors uh, in our community, <laughs> and they're doing great work. The only uh, way I'm going to pull rank around here is by trying to keep us on schedule. So the only thing I'm going to say now is that uh, it's an intractable problem, or else it's no problem at all. <laughs> 
uh, and we're going to work on it down both pathways simultaneously, as is best. And, and I want to thank, well, all these people here. Um, they, 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 uh, they identified themselves as having worked for me, but what they actually meant was I worked for them, and uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was better than working for Martin Fink. Thank you all very much. <laughs>